For 300 years, the ocean off Oregon has slept under watchful eyes, until deep sea alarms triggered a scramble scientists never expected. Shockwaves at impossible depths, substances that should not exist. If the ocean floor really is rupturing beyond all known patterns, what else is poised to break? The answers begin where our warnings once ended. On the night of January 26, 1700, a colossal earthquake struck the Pacific Northwest. The ground heaved and forests along the coast slid into silence. In Japan, almost 5,000 miles away, villagers recorded a wall of water crashing ashore with no warning and no local tremor. An orphan tsunami whose parent would remain a mystery for centuries. Along the Oregon and Washington coast, layers of sand buried tidal marshes and ghost forests appeared. Their roots drowned by sudden subsidence. These silent witnesses, preserved in the mud, hold the story of a rupture that ripped open nearly 1,000 kilometers of the Cascadia subduction zone. Centuries later, geologists traced the sand layers and dead trees, matching them to Japanese scrolls and indigenous oral histories. The Maka and other coastal nations spoke of villages swept away by the sea, of land that vanished in a single night. Their stories, passed down for generations, described shaking so violent that rivers changed course and shorelines shifted. What science would later confirm, these accounts had never forgotten. The land here is not stable, and the ocean can rise without warning. Sediment cores drilled from coastal marshes reveal the signature of that ancient disaster. A thick band of tsunami sand deposited far above normal tides sits between layers of peat and silt. Radiocarbon dating and tree ring analysis converge on the winter of 1700. The evidence is so clear that scientists can pinpoint the event to within a few days. Japanese records, written by candlelight, describe the same night, January 27th, by their calendar, as the moment an unexplained tsunami struck the eastern shore. The Cascadia subduction zone, stretching from Northern California to Vancouver Island, has been locked and quiet for more than three centuries, but its memory is written in the landscape and the stories that survived. Every drowned forest, every buried village, every sand layer is a reminder that the boundary between land and sea is fragile. The last time it broke, the world noticed. Today, this legacy shapes the way scientists watch the deep. The 1700 quake was not the first, nor will it be the last. Recurrence intervals calculated from marshes and offshore cores suggest these megathrust earthquakes strike every 300 to 600 years. Modern monitoring, with its web of sensors and alarms, is built on the knowledge that the quiet is temporary. The Pacific Northwest lives with a long shadow, a hazard measured in centuries, but never truly gone. The lessons of 1700 drive every decision about how and where to look for the next warning. Far from shore, a silent network stands guard over the deep. Hundreds of sensors strung, on strung along fiber optic cables rest on the ocean floor like an invisible watchtower. These instruments, part of the Ocean Observatory's initiative regional cabled array, monitor the restless summit of axial seamount and the surrounding ridge. Seismometers, pressure gauges, and hydrophones record every tremor, every subtle rise or fall in the seafloor, every faint murmur of magma below. Each device streams real-time data through cables spanning more than 500 kilometers, delivering the heartbeat of the ocean floor straight to laboratories on land. The density of this network is unprecedented. More than 150 instruments cluster around Axial's caldera, tracking movements as small as a few millimeters. Pressure sensors detect the slow inflation of the seafloor as magma accumulates, while seismometers pick up swarms of tiny earthquakes, sometimes hundreds in a single day. Hydrophones record the low rumbles and sharp cracks of rock breaking far beneath the surface. 
Cameras and chemical sensors mounted on moorings and robotic platforms scan for changes in vent fluids and temperature. This array does not sleep, it listens around the clock, alert for any sign that the volcano may stir. William Chadwick, a volcanologist who has studied Axial for decades, helped pioneer the use of these tools to forecast eruptions. In 2015, his team combined uplift measurements and earthquake counts to predict an eruption window, and the forecast proved correct. Since then, the challenge has grown. The volcano's behavior has become less predictable, with inflation rates and quake patterns shifting year by year. Scientists now rely on the cabled array's constant surveillance, watching for the telltale surge in seismicity or the sudden drop in pressure that could signal magma breaking through. This real-time vigilance has transformed how researchers study the deep ocean. Instead of waiting for the aftermath, they can witness the buildup to an eruption as it happens. Automated alarms flag unusual clusters of quakes or rapid changes in seafloor height, sending alerts to labs and ships in minutes. Data streams are public, letting researchers worldwide track the volcano's every move. The system's success in 2015 proved that, with enough eyes and enough patience, even the most remote volcano can be watched in detail. Yet the instruments do more than just record, they raise the stakes. With so much data, every anomaly becomes a clue, every deviation a potential warning. As inflation rates climb and earthquake counts tick upward, scientists know they are watching a system under pressure. The question is not if the volcano will erupt again, but when, and whether the next signal will arrive in time to catch the moment the ocean floor finally gives way. A sudden spike in acoustic energy set off alarms across the Ocean Observatory's initiative's control room. The waveform was unlike anything archived from Axial Seamount or the surrounding ridge. At 2.17 a.m., a sharp, low-frequency burst registered on hydrophones strung 280 miles off the Oregon coast. The signal cut through the usual background of microquakes and vent noise, a jolt that forced analysts to double-check for instrument error. But the data held, confirmed by a second sensor cluster almost 20 kilometers away. Riley Chen, the night shift's lead analyst, watched as a second, then third pulse arrived. Each signal carried the same signature, a rapid onset, a rolling decay, and a frequency spread that did not match any known volcanic tremor, tectonic slip, or ship-generated noise. The depth estimate, nearly 9,000 feet below the surface, placed the source well beneath the typical eruption zone. Within minutes, the on-call field team was activated. Aboard the research vessel, Dr. Luis Morales prepared the remotely operated vehicle for immediate deployment. The ROV, equipped with high-definition cameras and a suite of chemical sensors, was lowered through the steel moon pool and into the black water. As it descended, the control room mapped out the coordinates triangulated from the acoustic burst. The mission was clear, locate the source, document the disturbance, and collect physical evidence if possible. At 1,500 meters, the ROV's floodlights cut through a haze of suspended particles. The vehicle's sonar painted a jagged outline ahead, a fresh fissure split wide across the basaltic crust. The edges glowed with a faint shifting light, not the familiar orange of molten lava, but something more diffuse. Plumes of shimmering fluid streamed upward, distorting the video feed and triggering chemical alarms in the onboard sensors. The ROV's manipulator arm reached out, scraping a sample from the fissure's lip as the vehicle's hull vibrated in response to a distant, muffled detonation. Chen relayed the live feed to the onshore lab where geochemists and mineralogists watched in real time. The fissure stretched for hundreds of meters, its walls lined with unfamiliar deposits. In the control room, Technicians overlaid seismic data with the ROV's position, confirming that the acoustic bursts aligned with the newly exposed fractures. The team logged the precise time, depth, and coordinates for every sample and video segment, 
knowing that chain of custody would be vital for any future analysis. As the ROV rose back to the surface, carrying containers of water, gas, and solid fragments, Morales radioed his initial report. The site was still active, with periodic pulses registering on the ship's hydrophones. The control room flagged the event for urgent review, assigning a priority code reserved for only the most unusual discoveries. For the first time, the invisible violence of the deep ocean had left a tangible mark, one that would soon be scrutinized in laboratories from Seattle to Woods Hole. Lab teams at the University of Washington received the first sealed sample containers before sunrise. Inside, fragments scraped from the fissure's edge, and vials of shimmering vent fluid waited for analysis. The initial scans triggered a cascade of urgent calls. Mineralogists expected basaltic glass and familiar sulfide crusts, the usual signatures of axial seamount. Instead, X-ray diffraction patterns revealed unexpected peaks that did not fit any known phase cataloged from the Juan de Fuca Ridge. The electron microscope showed filamentous structures laced with elements rarely concentrated together, magnesium, iron, and traces of arsenic in ratios that defied the baseline for this region. In an adjacent lab, gas chromatographs spiked with readings of methane at levels hundreds of times background alongside a cocktail of heavier hydrocarbons. The isotope ratios suggested a blend of deep thermogenic sources and something else, possibly a rapid destabilization of ancient gas hydrate layers. As the data circulated, the mood in the control room shifted from curiosity to alarm. Geochemists debated whether the anomalies reflected contamination, instrument drift, or a true departure from known seafloor processes. Cross-checks with reference samples ruled out lab error. By the end of the day, three independent teams confirmed the findings. The mineral assemblage and gas chemistry could not be explained by any documented volcanic or hydrothermal system on the ridge. The working theory pointed to a new type of fluid rock reaction, possibly triggered by a sudden pressure drop or heat pulse along the fissure. Meanwhile, Sonar arrays aboard the research vessel mapped a methane plume stretching nearly 15 miles across the water column, dwarfing anything previously recorded in the area. Acoustic backscatter painted a dense, rising curtain of bubbles, some reaching within a few hundred meters of the surface. The plume's shape suggested an ongoing release, not a single event. Biologists aboard the ship logged a sharp decline in fish and invertebrate activity near the epicenter. Commercial fishermen monitoring their gear further east began reporting empty crab pots and trawl nets, as species that typically cluster along the slope vanished from their usual haunts. Satellite-linked buoys relayed oxygen measurements showing a drop in deep water levels across the plume's footprint. Microbial blooms fed on the methane, consuming oxygen, and pushing the local ecosystem toward hypoxia. In meetings that evening, marine ecologists warned that a prolonged event could collapse entire food webs, with ripple effects stretching from the deep benthos to coastal fisheries. The evidence now pointed beyond a localized eruption. The seafloor disturbance was triggering changes visible across dozens of miles with methane and unknown minerals feeding a chain reaction in the ocean itself. The question was no longer what had happened, but how far the consequences might reach if the venting continued unchecked. In conference rooms from Seattle to Washington, D.C., the debate is anything but quiet. Emergency managers armed with fresh streams of sensor data argue over what counts as a credible warning and what remains an academic anomaly. On one side, geologists press for immediate action, pointing to patterns in seismicity and vent chemistry that have never aligned quite like this before. Their counterparts in public safety demand certainty, something the data refuses to provide. Industry spokespeople enter the fray, insisting that without clear evidence of imminent disaster, offshore operations should proceed. They cite decades of benign eruptions at Axial Seamount and question whether the current anomalies justify any disruption of business. Meanwhile, behind closed doors, 
state officials receive updated FEMA guidance. The new memo, circulated quietly among coastal agencies, outlines a revised evacuation protocol for Oregon, Washington, and Northern California. The language is cautious, but unmistakable. Coastal communities are to review tsunami routes and keep communication lines open, just in case. Scientists clash over dueling hypotheses. Some argue the signals point to a new volcanic system forming beneath the seafloor, while others see evidence of tectonic fracturing that defies established models. Each side claims the data, but neither can offer guarantees. As the arguments escalate, the real dilemma surfaces. How to make decisions for millions based on a cascade of unknowns, the stakes are no longer confined to laboratories or research vessels. With every new reading, the pressure mounts for policymakers to choose between waiting for clarity and preparing for the unthinkable. Every hour, new fractures cut across, across the ocean floor, their locations tracked in real time, but their cause, their cause is still out of reach. In laboratories from Seattle to Cambridge, teams pore over seismic records and chemical assays, chasing patterns that refuse to settle into sense. The instruments deliver more data than ever, uplift curves, quake catalogs, and methane fluxes, but each answer only multiplies the questions. Some researchers argue for a volcanic cycle, others for tectonic stress, yet no model fits the full spread of evidence. There is no peer-reviewed explanation, no consensus, only a narrowing window as the fractures widen and the methane plumes spread. The decision clock shrinks. Emergency planners want thresholds, numbers, a clear signal to act. Scientists can only offer probabilities and caveats, their confidence eroded by every new anomaly. The data are public, the debates are increasingly tense, but the ocean keeps its secrets. With each passing day, the risk of waiting grows harder to ignore, yet the cost of a false alarm is just as steep. In the background, the sensors keep listening, logging every tremor, every pressure drop, every faint chemical trace. The community finds itself suspended between knowledge and uncertainty, forced to navigate a crisis that refuses to declare its shape. No one can say if the next rupture will be the one that matters, or just another symptom of a system in slow motion collapse. The fractures multiply, the timeline shortens, and the question remains unanswered. For now, the clock runs on, faceless and silent, as the deep continues to break open beneath the Pacific. The story is unfinished, and the next chapter waits to be written. Beneath the Pacific, the ocean floor is restless, monitored by scientists, but still holding secrets no sensor can predict. As methane seeps and tectonic tensions build, the next rupture may rewrite not just maps, but futures. What unfolds offshore shapes every life on the coast today. Sometimes the most urgent warning is the one we do not yet understand. Thank you for watching. Share your thoughts below.